Hey everyone, welcome back to Signal or Noise, episode 8. Charlie Bellello here, and with me as always, Peter Malouk. Today we have a lot of interesting topics to talk about. I want to start out with an important one. What makes a great investor? And Peter, as you know, this year, especially the last few months, pretty smooth sailing in terms of markets, right? Were, were you surprised by seeing the VIX here down 13 uh, lowest weekly close since January 2020, and now we have S&P 500 up over 20%, NASDAQ 100 up over 44%. We haven't seen a correction whatsoever since February-March period when we had that banking crisis that everyone's forgotten about. <laughs> and now, here's this quote from FDR, and I believe this applies to markets and investing. A smooth seat never made for a skilled seller, and I would say a smooth market never made for a great investor. What are your thoughts on what makes for a great investor? I mean, a great investor is looking over the long run, is patient, is consistent and persistent, and doesn't get caught up in the short-term narratives. And I mean, you were uh, putting a lot of stuff online about this in the middle of the chaos, is that these predictions, you know, they, they really don't hold a lot of merit no matter how you test them. And if you look at last year, I mean, the market down 20%. Um, it was very widespread, but big tech got finally, you know, got crushed. And big tech, there's five or six stocks that make up about 30% of the S&P 500. They all went into a bear market. And last year, so they were all down 20 plus percent. And this year, they're all up 20 plus percent. They make a big part of the S&P weighting. And that's a big part of it. And the other part of it is everybody was wrong. I mean, all the prognosticators, you know, the top 10 strategists and barons, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, everyone that said it was going to get worse. This was just the beginning. They were all completely wrong. And it's a, a great lesson in why the Fed, the Fed still had five more, six more rate hikes to go. Everyone was saying it was going to get worse. Unemployment was going to go up. Uninflation might not be tamed. If it was, it would be a crash landing. And everybody was wrong. And so the people that sat on the sidelines for part of that or tried to time it, they got punished and maybe maybe uh, permanently so. So it's not, it's not surprising to me. It's a, a tale as old as time when it comes to investing. This is the people in this space have the shortest memories, the very shortest memories. And it's because the narrative is always a little bit different, right? It's always a different set of facts. It's not the same set of facts. It's not a terrorist event and then COVID. And it's, it's something different every single time. And because that story changes, you know, this time it's, it's, it was uh, hikes and in interest rates and, and dealing with the effects of easy money after COVID before it was COVID. And before that, you've had all kinds of things from the housing bubble to 0809 to terrorist event. Because the story changes, like the reason we get scared at a horror movie, we go to a horror movie, we jump every time. It's the same general set of facts. Oh, somebody's in danger. There is a bad guy. Oh, it really is the bad guy. The bad guy kills a bunch of people. And then at the end, somebody gets away, but then the bad guy is still kind of alive. Yet we still jump. We get scared every single time. Because the story's a little different. That's what the stock market is. Nothing surprise, surprising at all that we just went through it again for the hundredth time. Yeah, so a few things in there I think that stand out. Number one would be you don't have to be able to predict the future or make these forecasts to be a great investor. In fact, if you listen to people like Warren Buffett, they would tell you the opposite is true. Don't do that. And that this forecasting game is a game of entertainment. People like to see it but it doesn't really add value. So like you said, if you made those types of bearish negative predictions last year, that likely prevented you from taking advantage of the opportunity. Stocks are down, stocks are cheaper. Mm -hmm. So just knowing that alone, I think will help you become a great investor. But more than anything else, it's getting through these difficult times. And I think when they look at the returns of someone like a Warren Buffett, they look at the cumulative returns and say, look how much he made over this period of time. Look how many billions he made. Not just Warren Buffett. They look at uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or anyone who's amassed a big fortune. And what's lost in that, Peter, is what happened along the way, the many years of hardship, the fact that Amazon went down 94% after the dot-com bubble. They forget all of that. They forget that Warren Buffett twice has lost 50% of his net worth during these big downturns. So getting through these difficult times, I would argue having that fortitude and it's really an emotional game uh, more than anything else, controlling your emotions is what's going to lead to being a great investor. Completely agree. And I think that the, what these great investors have in common is 
we talked about at the beginning of this segment, which is patience. I mean, they just don't get caught up in the day-to-day. And if they liked it at $100 a share, they probably really like it at $70 a share, especially when the events that are driving the price down tend to be more big picture and less company focused. Absolutely. So the advantage, I would argue, for the individual investor is they don't have to play that short term game that we hear about in terms of hedge funds are trying to meet that monthly performance number they have to send to their investors every single month. Uh, If it's not a good number, well, they risk outflows and they're trying to play that short term game. But in doing so, they're missing out on oftentimes on the bigger long term gains. And I think this chart really illustrates why it's in your favor to play the long game in any given year. There's such a huge variability in terms of what the S and P 500 could do possibility. So like the best year ever for the S and P 500 up over 50% worst year down over 40%. But as we, as we lengthen out that period of time, the range of possible outcomes shrinks. And if we go all out all the way out to 30 years, which if you start investing in your twenties, you should have a 30 year horizon. Well, that narrows to the point where the worst return was actually 8% annualized. That was the period starting right before the Great Depression. So the lesson here is pretty clear. If you're a long-term investor, the the odds are in your favor the longer you go. And that's an advantage you have over professionals who are trying to play the short-term game that no one can do anyway. A lot of people think that stock market's like a casino. Like I put my money in and, you know, today it could go way up or down. And that's true. In one day it's up or down. The odds are 50%. But it's like a casino, but not in that way. It's like a casino in that the longer you play, the more predictable the odds are. If you go to a casino, whether you play blackjack, craps, roulette, whatever you pick, um, if you in one, one hour, anything can happen. You can win or you can lose. But if you stay a week or a month or a year, right, the more you play, we know with certainty the house is going to win over the long run. The odds will eventually catch up that because the the, the house is is 51% plus on all these games. That's why if you win, they don't go, oh, God, please don't come back. They give you free breakfast buffet and and, and a a, a great room. And if you're a big gambler, they'll give you a big penthouse suite and send send, uh, uh, someone to actually let you gamble in your room because they know the longer you play, the more you're going to lose. The stock market, you as the investor are the house. On one day, it's 50-50. Over a year, the odds are going to win are 75%. You start to stretch it out over time, it becomes incredibly predictable. So the key is to stay at the table because you are the house. It doesn't matter if somebody is winning today or tomorrow or over the month. The longer you go, the more the odds are in your favor. But you're, And what you're really betting on there is a, is a, is a positive, positive expectancy game, but also betting on the fact that likely 20 or 30 years from now, things will be better than today. There's going to be growth. There's going to be certainly going to be inflation, most likely. There's, earnings will be higher 20 years from now. And in the short run, it's the price people are paying for those earnings that is all that matters. But in the long run, that starts to become less and less important the longer you go out. So I know people don't tend to think in terms of returns. They tend to think in terms of dollars. And if you look at, you're starting with a $100,000 portfolio, a year later, on average, you're going to have about 111,000. Right? This is going back. That, that's on average. If it's a year like 2022, 20, you're going to have less money after a year. Yeah. But as you go out, it, and it's it's really slow this compounding game, and it can be. We we know you can go a decade where it's very little compounding. But as you go out, the numbers really start to improve. Where uh, over a 10-year period, that average growth from 100,000 is to 300,000. 20 year period, you're over 900,000 at 30 years, you're over 2.5 million starting with that $100,000 portfolio. That's the average outcome. Obviously, every time is different. But the point here for investors is why play in that one year sandbox when you have all of this compounding growth, all of this potential for future gains? All you have to do is what what John Bogle said, which is don't do something, just sit there, essentially. The opposite of what most people want to do. Really take that Hippocratic oath and say, first, do no harm. Try not to interrupt compounding unnecessarily. I think if you look at, if, if you remember 20 years ago when you were driving around your city, and let's say you, you looked at, the, at 20 restaurants in a certain area. Well, if you fast forward to today, of those restaurants, most of them aren't there anymore. 
but some of them are still there, and the other ones have been replaced. But what we do know is if you go into all those restaurants that are there today, the prices are higher, right? We know that if we look forward 20 years from now, are those restaurants in your neighborhood, in your city, are those same ones going to be sitting there? Many of them won't be, but they will be replaced by other ones. And you could, with a high degree of confidence, assume that when you go look at a menu and you look at a steak or a burger or uh, whatever, it's going to cost a lot more. And that's like owning a diversified index-based stock portfolio, right? The names in the index, they're going to change. They're going to merge. They're going to close. New competitors are going to come in and do better. But it is very safe to say, like, like you point out, if we can wait a couple decades, yes, this game is going to work itself out. The prices are going to be higher. And so whether you're a positive thinker and you think there's going to be earnings growth, the economy is going to advance, or you're negative and you think, oh, none of that's going to happen, but there's going to be inflation, either way, there's higher prices on that menu, and it's safe to own that diversified portfolio over the long run. It's kind of ironic, right? Because the, all the people, the doomsday are about inflation, and I'm not dismissing it. Inflation's certainly been, been an issue the last few years, and it's been an issue over the long run, but they often make that as the case for a crash. And, and we did, did have a bear market last year, but if you look at places where there's the highest inflation, if we take like Venezuela or Argentina, and you look at holding cash in those countries versus their stock markets, it's night and day. The stock markets yeah. have actually kept pace with inflation in, in those hyperinflation areas. So we're not anywhere near, thankfully, a hyperinflation scenario. But certainly we know from the last hundred years that there's been no better investment in terms of inflation adjusted than the stock market. So right. even if you're bearish, but you do, I think it's better off having that mindset of the future is going to be better off than today. And if you look at the great investors, they're optimists. If you look at Elon Musk, you look at anyone who started a company, entrepreneur, right? They have to be optimistic about the future, I think, to participate in this. And that's just a better way of being. Like, certainly people can make a lot of money in short periods of time being short, but it's, it's, a, it's a small list and it's fleeting, right? That doesn't go on forever. We know bear markets are much shorter than bull markets and you don't have this situation we're looking at this chart here. There's no nothing comparable in terms of a short seller generating these types of returns. No, nothing anywhere even close. The best short seller in history doesn't come close to simply a passive mm -hmm. investor over a 30-year period. So great, uh, great uh, investors. We can all be great investors and individuals have an edge. I think that's an awesome thing. So here's one, Peter, I think uh, that's uh, everyone's confronting. Now you're probably getting a lot of questions on this. For over a decade, there was this saying, there is no alternative, and they gave it the acronym TINA. Well, we can cross out that note today. There is an alternative, and really what that acronym meant was, well, the Fed's keeping rates at zero. Int uh, interest on your bonds are so low that there's no alternative to investing in the stock market. You might as well take risk because you're getting nothing on your cash. Well, that has changed a lot since March 2022. Why has it changed? Well, the Fed controls short-term interest rates that can control 100 percent of the short-term interest rates in this country so when the fed hikes 11 times as they've done now 5.25 to 5.5 percent now you're getting that return on your cash if we look at three-month treasury bills 5.55 percent highest since january 2001 so someone a client comes to you and they say peter well, why should i take risk in, in the stock market stocks can go up they can go down I can get this guaranteed 5.5% yield and I don't have to take any risk. And how do you answer that question when there is an alternative again? Well, I think obviously having this alternative is nice because most people do need to have some short-term money available to them. If you're retired, you need several years worth of it, not just a, a couple months. And people that have jobs that may be insecure, they need to have savings uh, set aside that that's readily accessible to them. So it's good that they're not earning zero anymore. And there's there's an alternative to that. But these are not really a long term alternative to stocks. I mean, stocks are taxed at the lowest rate that exists, which is the capital gains rate. And these bonds are, are taxed at uh, income tax rates, which are the highest rates uh, that exist. And on top of that, you still have a much lower expected rate of return than stocks. So on an after tax basis, you can still expect to earn 250 to 300% more in equities uh, over the long run. So while there's an alternative, there's still a very big gap. And if you're a long-term investor, you're still going to be heavily rewarded. Also, these rates 
appear not to be very persistent over the long run. <laughs> you know, if you want to borrow money, if you want to lend money for a longer period of time, you're not going to get these rates. And of course, with municipals, you won't pay the income taxes, but the yields, you know, re reflect that as well. Yeah, we we can't predict where they're going to go. But if we look at the last few times after we were at these levels, let's say back in 2007 and before that, 2001, 2000, 2001, and what the Fed did following that aggressively cutting, anyone who said there is no alternative, <laughs> there, there's an alternative again, I'm just going to hold my money in cash. That that was good for for a, a little while, but not as long as people think. So it didn't it didn't last forever. These five and a half percent uh, yields. Hopefully this continues. As you said, it's great for anyone that's doing this. But over the next 30 years, are we going to average this? Probably not, especially given what's going on with the national debt and it continues to increase in the interest yeah. expense. There's going to be a lot of pressure, I think, pretty soon to start cutting these interest rates again. But in terms of keeping up with inflation, this is a very good thing. Like, like you said, people should have three to six months, ideally, of an emergency savings account. So for many people, having more than that is a good thing because it'll allow them to keep their money invested in the market and not and still sleep at night. So I'm a big proponent of that. Have enough cash where you can still sleep at night if the stock market goes down 20, 30, 40 percent. Well, now you can withstand that. And now you're finally getting an inflation adjusted yield above 3 percent. We haven't seen that in the last 20 years. So that's a pretty great thing to see. But I think this is the key chart here, Peter. If we're talking about odds and as an investor, that's what you do. You're trying to play the odds and in the short run, no one knows. And it's certainly, I would say, your odds of outperforming the market in cash are higher today with a 5% yield than zero. I think we could agree on that. But if we look at out 10 years and 20 years from now, I think the odds are still going to be pretty low. If we can see on a one-year period, cash has outperformed 30% of the time. We saw that in 2022. If you go to 10 years, that drops to 15%. If we go to 25 years, there's never been a period where cash has outperformed the stock market. And part of this is just in one year, the odds of the stock market's going to be negative or 25%. Right? So, I mean, yep. no matter what you do, uh, if you're a stock market <laughs> investor, I mean, even if you're um, Warren Buffett, you're down one in four years on average. And so and cash in the short the, run, cash, yeah. can look, <laughs> cash can look good. But in the long run, it works out just as you present it. Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about here. Pretty interesting thing that comes up all the time, but... Now it seems to be more front and center. Should our elected officials be allowed to trade stocks? If you're like most people, Peter, uh, like me, and I'm pretty sure you are, you're, it's a resounding no. They shouldn't. Uh, they did this poll, University of Maryland, and it didn't matter what party. We have a very polarized country in terms of most issues. There's Republicans think, believe one thing, Democrats believe another thing. This is not one of those things. It's uniform that people don't think that members of Congress or the president, vice president, Supreme Court justices, they should not be able to trade stocks. So we have this bipartisan bill that was proposed by Senator Gillibrand and Hawley, Democrat, Republican, saying we should do away with it. And in, in the bill, they talked about some of the reasons why. Well, we have over 3,700 conflict of interest in terms of reported <laughs> trades from Congress just from 2019 to 2021. You have 97 members of Congress where they're trading in companies that are affected by their committee. You have failing to report their stock trades and you have the list goes on and on really uh, where there's just an enormous conflict of interest where they're over overseeing things. And not only that, but they're getting a, an advantage here. How do we know that? Well, there's been a number of studies that have shown this and you, you and I know, Peter, it's very difficult to outperform the S and P 500 in 2022. The average amount of outperformance from these congressional stock portfolios was 17 and a half percent. I mean, this is, is better. This is better that they st literally Congress <laughs> is performing better than the greatest money managers of all time yes. as a group. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so offensive. It's so incredible to me that they're allowed to set, to trade individual securities. Uh, and the persistent outperformance is statistically impossible, right? They're, they are not just trading stocks. They are trading it on information that they have as insiders. It's terrible. Yep. It's, how it still exists is it, it, it's unbelievable, really. 
Yeah, and it and it does still exist, and it comes every few months. And I believe this bill that was proposed by Gillibrand and Hawley, it didn't get out of the committee, so they need a certain number of votes to get it out. It didn't get out, and so now let's put off to another. I think this is a winning issue for 2024. Whatever party you know wants to take it on, I think this will be something people will get behind. Maybe it's not, you know, that front and center for most people and that, that's why they're not pushing it people forget about it they hear about it, they're like this is crazy it shouldn't exist and then they forget about it they move on to their own lives and there's more important things their own economic situation and other things but to have this much bipartisan support and for it to not go through tells you that the vested interests are, are so great that they're preventing it from moving through. I mean, just it, there was I, I just in researching this, just looking at the countless examples, and it's not a one party thing from Republicans to Democrats of where they're uh, going to approve a legislation that affects the oil industry or affects the drug industry. And then you look into their portfolio, they have a massive position and a company to benefit from that. And how could that be a good thing for the American people? They're supposed to be enacting legislation that's in the best interest of the American people. Well, of course you're going to be conflicted if mm -hmm. you have this huge financial incentive. So, what am, what are we missing here? What that in terms of why this hasn't gotten more traction or why this is still allowed to go on? And really, this is just the beginning. I mean, like the fact that they can still that members of Congress can trade stocks is just blows my mind. It's just creates total misalignment uh, with the Americans that they represent. But not only that, whenever we get this passed, which looks like it might be a challenge, they need to make another law that if you're in any role of influence or on a committee regulating any industry, you cannot immediately after Congress uh, go work in that industry because you're, again, misalignment. Sure. And now you're going to be doing favors for people in exchange for future consulting gigs and jobs. The the If we could solve a lot of problems, if we could create alignment and this allowing stock picking, allowing people to go become lobbyists right when they come out of uh, service, which I use loosely, uh, allowing them to do that creates the, these conflicts that generate a ton of policies that are bad for America. Yeah, sh sure. So like, if, if and this would be a good start, and if they ban this, I think everyone would be happy with that. But as you said, let's say they, they did ban it, but then a company comes to this congressman and says well after after you leave office we're going to give you five million dollars for a speaking fee if you come and speak right. <laughs> then that's that shouldn't be allowed either to some extent so yeah or taking a position at the company maybe for mm -hmm. a certain number of years i think that i think is wishful thinking in terms that they're going to get get mm -hmm. rid of that cash cow as well right. but i think eventually and it'll i think it'll just come to the point of which party wants to take it and run with it and see it as an advantage and and then maybe it'll get through but it's amazing to me that this still exists i know the fed had a similar issue in terms of someone inside the fed using trading and that they changed their policy there in terms of of stock trading and so uh hopefully we'll see the same here but i'm not holding my breath to see it anytime soon but here's a fascinating thing and of course Anytime you see outperformance in the market, people want to take advantage of it. So you're hearing, and we've heard this for years, there's all of these services now you could sign up for to get uh, these stock picks from Congress. TikTokers are trading stocks by copying Congress. And naturally, Peter, the ETF industry never misses a boat. There's now two ETFs that allow you to follow along with Democratic trades which is the ticker Nance, N-A-N-C, and Republican Trades, K-R-U-Z, Cruz. And it's just fascinating to me that people would think that you could buy these things and lead to outperformance because there's a lag in terms of when the information has to be reported. It's a 45-day window, so you're getting lag data. They're trading on this information probably right before it happens and getting that benefit. Uh, but it's just, it's just... It never ceases to amaze me how the ETF industry tries to capitalize on a trend uh, that you know, seems to be oh it's oh it's free money look at this let's let's get uh, let's get this uh, let's get this new product out there. <laughs> you know these ETFs following along with uh, the trades of Republicans and Democrats uh, 
interestingly, might actually work based on historically how much Congress has outperformed, although I think that's going to get regulated away. What surprises me that it doesn't exist, or if it does, that it's not mainstream enough that I know about it yet, is I'm surprised they're not ETFs that are just red and blue ETFs that track Republican policies and Democrat policies, just Mm. because people are so polarized that I do think that ETFs in it those probably spaces, doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, they probably, sure they that, probably yeah. doesn't exist. I, I mean, I, I would never invest in one, but it seems like the kind of thing that would probably do pretty well, given how uh, passionate people have become about, you know, entrenching themselves in, in a just a straight party line of positions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think these things would work if it was real time. If it was a managed account where as soon as they made a trade, it made the same trade for you. <laughs> Yeah, sure, that's going to work. The problem is the lag here, similar to looking yeah. at 13F data for hedge funds. Yeah. By the time you're buying it, it's they may have already sold the position, right? You don't you don't get any of that information uh, in, until it's much later. So uh, we'll revisit this if it ever it ever does go through. There'll probably be another few bills uh, in the next year, uh, but just crazy and mind boggling that this thing still exists. All right, we're gonna end with signal or noise. We have a few things to discuss here. Number one, Peter, you've probably been hearing about the streak in the Dow that we just had ended at 13 consecutive up days. And that was tied with 1987, January 1987, for the second longest streak in Dow history. Dow goes back to 1896. And if you go through Twitter, you'll hear people saying, well, this this has to be a positive, right? The markets <laughs> going up 13 days in a row has to be it means something. Uh, what's your take on statistics that you hear like this, which we get all the time? The market's constantly doing things that it hasn't done in a long time or hasn't done ever before. I mean, you could interpret it as consumer or as investor sentiment, but we do know that it's generally worthless. That it's un, it, it doesn't. Worthless meaning it is not predictive of what's going to happen over the next year. And so I I put this in the noise category. Yeah, same. I I tested the data. You don't see anything in terms of abnormal positive returns going forward. It's not negative. So it's not a bad thing that stocks have gone up a number of days days in a row. But I would compare it to people that go into a casino uh, betting on black or red. And they'll see black has hit. 10 times in a row and they'll say, well, it can't hit again, but the <laughs> odds are independent, right? Going right. forward. It's still 50, 50 odds on that next roll. And mm-hmm. you could lose a lot of money betting against those streaks, uh, in terms of performance, similar thing here, just because it's up 13 days in a row, it does not affect what the market is going to do going forward. The odds, you know, are not impacted by these long streaks. So number two here, this is an interesting one. There's this poll that's put out by the National Association of Active Investment Managers. So there's people that are swinging their portfolios wildly in different directions, up or down. A poll them every week asking what is their average equity exposure to the market. And for the first time since November 2021, they reported being over 100% exposed on average. So that means they're using some leverage in their portfolio. And if we contrast that with last October, when the S&P 500 was a thousand points lower, they had less than 20% exposure to the equity market. What do you make of, of this types of sentiment? We talked about bull and bear polls. When you see something like this, is there any signal to it or is it all just noise? Well, I think the proof that it's noise is when the market was doing poorly, they were on the sidelines. Right now, now it's doing better, and they're then they're more they've got more exposure, so they're they're kind of proof that they're not good at predicting where the market is going to go. Their investors suffered uh, greatly from following their tactical advice, you know, the, the predictions about where the market would go over the short run. So what I would say, and I, and I looked at the data here, and I said, looking at the most extreme reading, so where we are today, and then looking at the most extreme downside readings when they had the 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 least exposure there's a signal in only one of those categories and that's it that's when they're extremely bearish so last october when they didn't want any exposure to the equity market that actually there actually was some signal to that we actually see better returns over the following year when they have their lowest exposures and this data goes back 
to 2006. And we see this time and time again. We saw it in 2008 number of times. We saw it during 2020. But as you can see, it often just tracks what the market is mm -hmm. doing. And if you're tracking what the market is doing, and we know during extreme downturns when stocks go down a lot, they tend to do a little bit better in the next year. And that, I think that's all it's telling you. So mostly noise, 99% of the time noise. Once in a while you get a signal, but only on, on really on the downside readings. And this is pr interesting, but probably not surprising to you, Peter. I looked at, well, what if you had just bought the S&P 500 and held it since July 2006? That's when they started doing this weekly poll versus adjusting your exposure following these active managers. So saying if they're 90% long, you'd be 90% in the S&P 500. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. They're obviously not just buying the S&P 500. They're probably buying stocks and different things, but just tracking the S&P. If you're 90%, you go 90% at the S&P. If they go down to 20%, well, you're in 20% for that week. How would that have done versus a buy and hold? As you can see here, this is not including transaction fees or taxes, right? Uh, that would make the gap even wider. S&P 500 has quintupled, so up over 400% versus 186% gain if you're were adjusting your exposures every single week based on these <laughs> these these uh, shifts in active manager exposure. So really telling that uh, moving just action, and it comes back to that first do no harm, harm just being active in your portfolio in the long run, it, it, it actually is counterproductive. In the short run, it can be better or worse, right? If we look at the period in 2008, if you have a long bear market and you're cutting exposure into that, you're going to do better, right? If you have 30% exposure throughout 2008, by you know, by definition, you're going to do better in that period of time. But most years are positive. Most you know, long-term periods are positive. So you're fighting that by adjusting the exposure. And I don't think I don't know if there's <laughs> you read anything more into this, but I think it just tells you these are professional active managers, and they can't do it. And this is not including their own fees. Uh, that they're charging and taxes and all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is what makes it so hard to be that individual tactical trader is if you look at the professionals, the professionals persistently and consistently cannot do it. Um, but there's just something in human nature that we want to believe that we can do it individually, right? And the data is overwhelming and it doesn't change uh, over time. It doesn't change if it's us or international or big or mid or small there's slight variances but the same principles apply and that is where we began this this the long-term investor is going to win primarily because they have mega trends supporting them mega trends and so whatever negative things happen they tend to be short-lived and it might not feel short-lived if six months or 12 months seems long but they are in the grand scheme of things over a lifetime of investing short lived. And that's where the winners and the losers separate because the winners just, they're still in. They keep investing through the whole thing. Absolutely. So normally we, when we talk about this a lot, we talk about that there's a return cost to trying to pursue active management. And there was a recent study that came out called the deadweight loss of active management it studied active equity funds from 1991 to 2021 and actually put a dollar value on it or at least try to here saying the aggregate loss to investors in these funds was 235 billion dollars and they broke that down part of that came from inefficient portfolio allocation 186 billion and the other part 49 billion came from fees so there's a real cost for to investors trying to pursue that we often don't quantify it and for everyone's individual situation, that cost is going to be different. But you're trying to fight the odds here. This distribution table really shows you here 92% of funds underperformed, right? So you're fighting that game of trying to be in those few particular funds that outperform over a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, if if you could go to a casino and win 82% of the time, you would go every single day. You wouldn't try to find a different game. And it's just the investors, they look at that 8% and they see opportunity. <laughs> human nature. <laughs> it's human nature, yep. So I want to end, Peter, with an update on a prior signal or noise topic. 
and this is one of our favorites. We obviously were in agreement here in terms of the sell in May and go away. Morgan Stanley was trying to tell people that this year it may be apt. Uh, how should you position your portfolio? You have stagflation, blah, blah, blah. All the rest of it. every year is a, a different thing. Well, if you positioned your portfolio so far based on this sell in May and got out of the market at the end of April, S&P 500 is up <laughs> over 10%. So yet another example here mm. so far of Selene not working out as planned. Right. I mean, and, and to think that like one of the largest brokerage houses in the world, that was the message, right? I mean, we're talking about this like it's it's almost comical that people follow <laughs> rules like this. But I mean, this yeah. is these are, you know, high level analysts and, and brokerage houses that people are taking advice from. And it's. Obviously, this is an example of it not working out, but in general, it doesn't work out, and none of this sort of advice should be followed. To me, when you hear advice that says, if you leave at this point in the market and you enter at this point, it's going to work out for you better, and that's a short-run tactic, I would ignore 100% of the rest of the advice coming from that specific <laughs> source <laughs> because it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a warning sign. It's a red flag that yeah. the rest of the advice is also – fighting statistical probability it's fighting the fighting the odds that things are actually going to work out if you follow it yeah and there's just no way the problem that we talked about among many when we said don't follow this advice are the years like this where you have these big gains and now you're in a position if you did sell out now what do i do do i chase it higher do i wait till it comes back and that's just a terrible game for a long-term investor to play and we'll end with this chart on that point. This is showing you, and it's, I think it surprises some people, but it really shouldn't. If you're a long-term investor, the month that you start investing does not matter at all. It's There's very little variability, and the longer you go, there's less and less variability between any given month and what the returns are going forward. You have a positive expectancy no matter what if you're a long-term investor. So why play this game? And we, as we talked about, the May through October period is positive over 70% of the time on average tend to have a positive return anyway. So you don't want to bet <laughs> against a positive expectancy. If you're a long-term investor, any month is a good month to invest. So yeah. thanks everyone for joining us for signal and noise. If you like the content, please subscribe to the channel. We're also on all the podcast platforms. So check us out there. If you prefer, and we'll see you next time on signal or noise.